Hello. Good evening. I am indeed Harvey Bruff. I extend a big welcome to our soloists, Emily Dankworth, Christina Gill, Wills Morgan, Michael Henry, and to you, the gorgeous audience in the Museum of London. Thank you for coming. It would be kind of grim without you. <laughs> and also to everybody out in the internet zone. Greetings to all. Now, you just heard, heard um, it announced, and I'm going to prove it to you, that I'm a, a, an expert in community music. I'm going to ask you to sing something, which I'm sure will fill you with horror. Um, <laughs> But singing is something that we all should do. In fact, we sang before we speak. As babies, we make noises and we, we speak later. And uh, in this modern life, sometimes the ability or the, the belief in the ability to sing loses us a bit. So I'm going to teach you a little bit of a, a, a spiritual. And it goes like this. Um, you can choose any note, any note you like. I want you to sing Sister's Pray. I think you'll see, see the... the the, the words there. Okay, the first time it says sisters pray times three and it comes here. Sisters pray. Okay, who can sing that? And one. Sisters pray. And then another one down. Sisters pray. And another one. Sisters pray. And then all together. And help me to drive old Satan away. Try that bit again. And help me to drive old Satan away. It's extremely good. But I think it could be better. Um, so we're going to do it this time with them singing something different. Okay? So that you'll hear them sing, Sisters. And I've just realized that... Um, it's in a different order. Can we sing sisters first and brothers second? Because that will help our audience. Um, okay? So, first thing, first time sisters. See, live music. Don't you love it? Um, sisters pray. And they're going to sing sisters, won't you? And you just, as soon as they sing sisters, you sing sisters. So they go, sisters, sisters pray. Okay, try that. And sisters, sisters pray. Sisters pray, sisters pray, and help me to drive old Satan away. That's ex that is really good. That is really good. So the second time, it will be brothers. Let's just try that. There'll be something happening before. It's a bit of speaking. Or... So even for brothers. Brothers pray, brothers pray, with feeling, brothers pray, and help me to drive old Satan away. Excellent. And after that one, you're going to sing the whole tune, which you probably know anyway. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord, nobody knows like Jesus. Okay, so, and then it's the same thing again. That's in fact just repeats itself. So it says, all, this is the very last time you just sing that bit. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Twice. Try that with me. And nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Fantastic. So you're now part of the lecture. You're not, not just sitting there looking on. That's the only bit of singing you have to do, unless you're moved to join in elsewhere, but that's the bit. Let's just, um, everybody clear. You're going to hear some singing from the soloists, and then when they sing, sisters, you sing, sisters, pray. And then you stop for a bit, and listen again. And then when they sing, brothers, brothers, pray, you sing there. And that time, and the second time, you keep going with, nobody knows the trouble I... That's it. We have no time to rehearse more than that. So now the lecture will officially start. Thank you. So, first, the big question. How did I, Harvey Bruff, a choir boy from Coventry, come to stand before you telling this story? I remember being quite young, maybe nine years old, and being introduced to a mysterious thing, rather clumsily called a Negro spiritual. The song was Steal Away to Jesus, and though obviously religious, was very different to any of the music I customarily sang with my choir. When I was older, I learned that songs like this came out of the horror of slavery, and that though they were folk songs, so anyone in theory could sing them, singing them was a complicated matter. 
Then, much more recently, in, tw in 2013, my friend Justin Butcher and I were running a choir, which we still run, called Vox Holloway, and some of them are here tonight. We were aware that the 150th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's proclamation of emancipation fell that year. We wanted to do something to mark the occasion. So again, I turned my attention to the genre of spirituals, and once again, I found that it was pretty much pretty difficult to find a reason to sing them. They sprang from such barbaric events. I did a lot of research and pretty much gave up the idea. Then, by chance, I came across a reference to an extraordinary story about the group called the Fisk Jubilee Singers. It seemed scarcely credible. Had a group of ex-slaves really traveled to this country and sung to the highest and lowest in the land, touring all over the British Isles and even singing to Queen Victoria? At that time, there was precious little information about them on the internet. So my friend and member of Vox Holloway, Tricia Zipfel, suggested I meet with Viv Broughton, a gospel expert who, in fact, I had come across because he also runs the premises rehearsal studio in Hackney. Viv did know about the Jubilee Singers, and when I asked him about them, he simply said, you need this book, and handed me a red-bound tome that dated from about 1880. There it is. There's the book. When I looked at it, I was really excited for two reasons. Firstly, it was called The Story of the Jubilee Singers by J.B.T. Marsh, and I could immediately see that it had the information I was seeking. Secondly, the subtitle was With Their Songs, and when I turned to the back, I saw about 130 songs laid out rather like hymns. Amongst them were some very well-known spirituals, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Go Down Moses, Deep River, and others. Also, some that seemed to me quite obscure, listened to the angels shouting. When Justin and I began to study the book in earnest, it struck us that by telling the story of the people who brought the music to us, perhaps we could find a context in which the songs could be sung. Here is that story, as told in the piece that Justin and I created from the material. It's called Freedom Song, and it starts in slavery. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. I was born in Morganstown, Kentucky. I was born and raised in Lynn County, Tennessee. I was born way down in Alabama, that place named Notasoga. I was born in Black River, Louisiana. I was born on Massachusetts Plantation, down in Virginia, near Lynchburg, in Campbell County. I don't know where I've been born. Nobody never did tell me. We, we was born slaves. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Lord, my white folks was rich. They had as many as five or six hundred niggers, men, women, and children. In my daddy's time and all along my mama's time, that's when they chained the colored people and cut them all to pieces with a cat of nine tails and sprinkled salt and pepper on them. Sisters, sisters, pray for me. Sisters, sisters, pray for me. Sisters, sisters, pray for me and help me to drive old Satan away. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. The times I hate most was picking cotton when the frost was on the balls. My hands get so and crack open and bleed. Night never come out where you had nothing to do. Time to cut tobacco. If they wanted to cut all night long out in the field, you cut. Didn't matter about you tired. You afraid to say you tired. Brothers, brothers, pray. Brothers pray. Brothers, brothers pray, brothers pray, and 
help me to drive old Satan away. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows like Jesus. We had real bad eating bread, meat, water, and they fed it to us in a trough, just like the hogs. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs. Have the auction bench and bid on you just same as you bidding on cattle. They'd have a regular sale every month at the courthouse and get $200, $100, $500. Slavery was the worst days was ever seed in the world. And I got the scars on my old body to show to this day. I see it worse than what happened to me. What I hated most was when they beat me. And I didn't know what they beat me for. And I hated they stripped me naked as the day I was born. Solomon, the overseer, beat them with a big whip and that's a look on. They cut the flesh most to the bones and some they never got up again. Some of the people I belonged to was in the Ku Klux Klan. I used to see them turn out. They went round whip them niggas. They get young girls and strip them stark naked and put them on cross barrels and whip them till the blood run out of them and then they put salt in the raw parts. The piece continues with a short account of the American Civil War, including a representation of a battle between two tunes, Dixieland and John Brown. This section finishes with Abraham Lincoln's declaration. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States of America and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy thereof, do hereby proclaim and declare that on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Woke up this morning with my mind. Woke up this morning, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind. Woke up this morning, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind. Woke up and stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 On January 9th, 1866, six months after the last shot was fired in the Civil War, the Fisk University opened for classes in Nashville, Tennessee, a permanent university for the higher education of the freed people. The Fisk University was founded on faith. And precious little else. The founders faced a terrible struggle in their quest to establish an educational foundation. Nashville where they began to build university, was the dark heart of slavery in the South. They struggled to find and afford land. All the odds were stacked against them, but they persevered and bought a lease on an old hospital barracks of the Union Army. A ramshackle university began to take shape, but the campus buildings, cheaply and hastily constructed, soon fell into decay. How could funds for a new building be found? Enter a remarkable man, George White, who was indeed a white man. George White, blacksmith's son from New York. Former school teacher. Veteran of the bloody battles of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville. He was the treasurer of the new university, but had a feeling for music which led him to form a choir, singing music considered to be suitable. Gonna sing, gonna sing, gonna sing, gonna sing all along the way. Ooh, I'm gonna sing, gonna sing, gonna sing, gonna sing, gonna sing all along the way. Gonna 
sing, gonna sing all along the way. In spring 1867, the group gave its first public concert. Perhaps they could raise funds by singing songs pleasingly, pleasing to a predominantly white audience. Is the lily of the valley, oh my Lord, is the lily of the valley, oh my Lord. The concert was a great success. A great success financially. A leading daily newspaper interpreted the concert as evidence that the Negro was susceptible of education. What kind of shoes are those you later, the singers gave a magnificent rendition of that fine cantata, Esther, the Beautiful Queen, by Mr. W.B. Bradbury to a large and delighted assembly. They went on to Memphis. Where we fill the opera house to burst it. Then south to Chattanooga. Where the audience cheered us to the echo. At about this time, the National Teachers Association of the United States held an annual convention in Nashville. And we was to sing at the opening convocation. To the great disgust of some who were profoundly indignant that the damn niggers could not be kept in their own places. But we turned out so popular, they asked us to sing at every session. These shoes I wear are gospel shoes. Oh. So far, so good. The singers from Fisk had taken their first tentative steps into performing, but then something remarkable happened. One of the singers, Miss Ella Shepherd, that's me, led a small group of students to the office of the Fisk principal. And with some air of mystery, they asked Principal Spence to lock the door and draw the curtains and then, as if disclosing some shameful secret, they sang to him some of the old-time religious slave songs, long since known as Jubilee songs. The songs of sorrow of the plantation are slavery. We never sang those songs to anyone but ourselves. They were sacred to our parents, sacred and secret. Melodies of suffering, 
of anguish and a fierce hope of freedom. Many times we used to sit together, just sit on the floor and sing to each other soft. dream of singing those songs in public we was free now why should we sing the slave songs of our people suffering for the entertainment of white folks but at mr. white's behest I started to transcribe the secret songs of the plantation steal away and swing low sweet chariot the go down Moses deep river and Guided by George White, they did start singing them in public. The reaction was enormous. A review in Tonic Solfar magazine said, the singers came with their signature piece, Steal Away. The first chords came floating on our senses like gentle fairy music, and they were followed by the unison of the phrase, Steal Away to Jesus, delivered with exquisite precision of time and accent. Then came the soft chords and bold unison again, followed by the touching, throbbing cadence. I ain't got long to stay here, like whispering to the soul. There are no recordings of the original Fist Jubilee singers, but a second, smaller group was formed some 20 years later, a male quartet led by John Work II, and they were recorded between 1909 and 1916. We'll play a short extract, a spiritual in bright mansions above. As you will hear, it's quite restrained, definitely a spiritual sound, not full-on gospel, which came much, much later. But it has a fervency and a latent passion which must have sounded remarkable to people hearing it 120 years ago and gives us an idea of how the original Fisk singers might have sounded.
The relationship of George White, a white man, to his singers, all of whom had been slaves or suffered directly from the consequences of slavery, is almost impossible to imagine now. But he was obviously a very good man who had fought a war to set slaves free. He hatched the idea of taking a group on the road to raise the much needed funds to continue the construction of Fisk University. This was courageous. At this point, he had no support, indeed rather more than disapproval of his superiors at the university. No funds were available for such a daring plan. A group of ex-slaves going on tour to perform to who knows who. So to make it happen, he mortgaged his own house and the group of singers tentatively set out on a concert tour of the South. They suffered terrible discrimination. They were turned away from countless hotels and hardship. They couldn't even afford overcoats to protect them from the cold. But little by little, they began to find an audience for their music, including some of the songs of sorrow. They continued their tour through the South. Oh, oh. October the 7th, 1871. George White with 11 singing students of Fisk University. Ella Shepard, Maggie L. Porter, and Jenny Jackson Sprangs. Minnie Tate, Eliza Walker, and Phoebe J. Anderson Controuders. Thomas Rutland and Benjamin M. Holmes Tennis. And Green Evans, Isaac P. Dickerson, and Big George Wells on the bass. And as given us to the young ladies, Miss Wells, principal of the American Missionary Association School of Athens, Alabama. Thirteen persons in all. Just like Jesus and his twelve apostles. Oh, 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 two churches of Cincinnati. Full audiences greeted us with appreciation, but the donations were few. For it was on that Sunday and Monday that the great Chicago fire of 1871 swept away the houses of 100,000 people. In Ohio, as everywhere else, people could scarcely think about or talk about anything else except the fire. Collections for the victims were set up in every town and city of every state. There could not have been a week less favorable in which to commence our work. We decided to give the proceeds of the first paid concert. Some less than $50. To the Chicago Relief Fund.
in the next town, Chillicott, we were turned away from the main hotel on account of our colors. At the second hotel, the story was the same. No admittance to Negroes. At the third hotel, the landlord gave us his own bedroom as a parlor. And served up our meals in private. Otherwise, all his guests would have up and left, he said. Unexpected as it was, and painful to endure, it seemed it was to be part of the singer's mission to break down this odious and cruel colour prejudice. Their struggles in America's South nearly broke the, the spirit of the group, but, led by George White's extraordinary zeal, they began to change the hearts and minds of their audiences, and, as importantly, began to break even on the considerable costs of touring with a sizable group. At this time, Mr. White was preoccupied with how to promote the singers. We were billed as Negro minstrels or other demeaning names. In Columbus, after an anxious and almost sleepless night, a name for the group presented itself, the Jubilee Singers. The year of Jubilee was in the Bible when all the captives were set free. When we were slaves, we used to pray for the year of the Jubilee to come. And it had come at last and we were witnesses to its advent. We were the Jubilee Singers. And thinking about that name was the best night's work we ever did. Next, they began to tour the North of America where they began to find real success and fame while still experiencing some discrimination along the way. Even the favorable reviews that they received still saw them as something of a novelty act. The New York Tribune said, the wild melodies of these emancipated slaves touched the fount of tears, and gray-haired men wept like little children. We have long enough had its caricature in corked faces. Our people can now listen to the genuine soul music of the slave cabins. Boston, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, on and on. And in New York, we were sponsored by the famous preacher, Henry Ward Beecher. He proclaimed... Folks can't live on air. Though they sang like nightingales, they need more to eat than nightingales do. Next week, the Jubilee Singers shall give a concert in my church, and the congregation shall endow them with a lavish benefit. The concert in Plymouth Church was thronged, and we were the heroes of the hour. They closed the first season with a final night in Troy, New York, and set off home to Nashville with the astonishing sum of $20,000 raised for the Fisk University. In today's money, nearly $400,000. It was Mr. Mark Twain who first proposed that the Jubilee Singer should travel to England. Once the foremost slave trader nation of the world. Mark Twain wrote to his friend, the Earl of Shaftesbury, that renowned Christian philanthropist and reformer, to arrange matters. And so it was that in May 1873, less than two years after we first sent out from Nashville, we found ourselves in London at Willis's rooms, giving a concert to a private audience of the highest in the land. Lords and ladies, members of parliament, clergymen, newspaper editors, everyone invited personally by Lord Shaftesbury himself. The singers carried the audience by storm. Congratulations were lavished upon them, and the Duke and Duchess of Argyle beseeched them most solicitous I knew I was going to say that yeah. solicitously, most <laughs> solicitously to visit them the next day at Argyle Lodge. Imagine our surprise and delight to learn that Her Majesty, the Queen of England, was expected soon. Her request was for us to sing Steal Away to Jesus. 
Who could have imagined that day at Fisk when young Miss Ella Shepherd first sang Steal Away to Principal Spence behind closed doors with curtains drawn that one day she'd be singing it before the Queen of England? Green trees are bending Poor sinners stands a-trembling The trumpet sounds it in a my soul I ain't got long to stay There was great irony in this, since Britain was indeed the most enthusiastic slave trade nation. But the Jubilee singers were retreated with great respect and admiration wherever they sang here. Over the next three months, we was invited to sing everywhere. In Westminster Abbey and the Crystal Palace. In schools, universities, hospitals, and soup kitchens. They did scores of concerts in the years 1876 to 1877 in England, Scotland, and Ireland visiting most of the major cities, but also much smaller places. Saffron Walden. Grimsby. Later, they even holidayed for six weeks in Scarborough, which must have been a slight challenge in spite of its billing as the queen of watering places. They still struggled with finances as the costs of touring were great, and as they became more and more famous, some of the pitfalls of notoriety affected them. There were arguments within the group and arguments with the management. They began to demand proper fees for their singing. There was even, when they reached Europe, an affair within the group involving one of the married members. Pretty scandalous stuff which contrasted with the dignified way they conducted themselves most of the time. But I think Britain can be proud of the reception that the Jubilee Singers were given here. Only 20 years previously, they had been suffering the effects of slavery, but now, they were established stars and played to huge audiences all over the country. We sang for Prime Minister Gladstone twice. The second occasion was when he invited us to breakfast with him and his family. He was captivated by our singing. He said, it was not the music alone. Their eyes flashed. Their countenances told of reverence and joy and gratitude to God. This is Ella Shepherd's story. In Freedom Song, we imagine her telling it to the assembled lords and ladies. My father was a slave. My mother was a slave. And I was born on a plantation, a frail and skinny little baby slave. I was like to die, but I didn't. When I was around three, the mistress come to my mama and say, Sarah, you are an insolent girl. I'm going to sell you down the river to Mississippi. But I will keep your little daughter Ella here with me. Well, my mama decided to throw herself off the cliff into the Cumberland River and me too. She was stumbling down the dusty river road, dragging me behind her. But an old black woman saw her face and she just knew what my mama had in mind. She put her hand on Mama's shoulder and she said, Now, don't you do it, honey. You gotta wait. Wait till the chariot of the Lord swing low. God's got great work for this little child to do. She gonna stand before kings and queens. Honey, don't go to the river. So, Mama took me back to our little cabin, 
And she held me in her arms all that night. And she sang to me till they came to take her away. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan. And what did I see coming for to carry me home? A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. Sweet. announced that the marvellous and heart-stirring melodies of the Jubilee Singers could be heard that night at the Downs Chapel, Hackney Downs, Clapton. Tickets may be obtained of Mr. Sermon, family grocer, corner of Lee Bridge Road. Of Miss Dossiter, book dealer, Dalston Lane. Of Mr. Coventry, printer, 400 Mare Street. And at the offices of this newspaper, then Come we was invited to sing at Dr. Thomas Barnardo's East End Juvenile Mission at the Ragged School in Hope Place, Hackney, where Mr. John Newman, the manager of the mission, felt that such singing from the soul should not be forgot. Mr. Newman speedily set to work to teach the children of the mission the songs of the Jubilee Singers, and a new choir was born the East London Jubilee Singers of Hackney. I'm sometimes up and sometimes down Coming for to carry me home But still my soul feels heavenly bound Coming for to carry me As they began in London, so they continued in city after city through Britain and Ireland, country after country, carrying all before them, on to the great courts and capitals of Europe and on to the Orient, to the palaces of India and Japan and the churches and city halls of Australia, winning great renown and great endowment for Fisk University, assuring its legacy to posterity. These tours raised an estimated $150,000 for the university, funds used to construct Fisk's first permanent building. Named Jubilee Hall, the building still stands and is used today as dormitory accommodation for students. The beautiful Victorian Gothic building houses a floor-to-ceiling portrait of the original Jubilee Singers, commissioned by Queen Victoria during the 1873 tour as a gift from England to Fisk. Freedom Song is a full-length piece in two halves, telling the Fisk Jubilee Singer's story. You've just heard some of that story. 
The piece goes on to question how we should react to it and how the struggle for equal rights that the Jubilees started over 150 years ago was taken forward by the civil rights movement in the 20th century. It also looks at the uncomfortable truth that slavery is still with us. 155 years ago, when Abraham Lincoln made the Declaration of Emancipation, there were a million people of African origin in slavery in the United States. Today, there are an estimated 46 million people trapped in slavery across the globe. The modern slave trade is one of the fastest growing industries in the world today, representing $150 billion a year in illegal profits. So it was hard to finish the piece on a bright and happy note as slavery hasn't truly been abol abolished. One reason why we wanted to tell the Jubilee story was that their treatment in Britain was respectful and full of admiration for them as singers and as human beings. Even though this country was deeply involved in the transatlantic slave trade for nearly 250 years, from the time of Elizabeth I until Britain's abolition of slavery in 1807. During that time, British ships carried an estimated 3.4 million enslaved Africans to the Americas. It's not possible to walk anywhere in this country without being implicated in this. All the big cities, Liverpool, Bristol, London, Glasgow, everywhere, is built with the profits of the slave trade. David Olusoga, the learned writer in these matters, who I'm honored to stand alongside in this series of lectures, writes, the black history of this country must be taken seriously and become much more mainstream. I think that has to come from all sides. And it seems to me that we have a story here that all of us, black and white, can learn from. Furthermore, it's a story that's hardly known in this country. It's becoming better known now as more material keeps appearing. But when I worked with the Hackney Empire, Hackney Empire Community Choir, who sang with us in our performance last March at the Hackney Empire, I asked two of them had heard the story. Not one had, even though many of them sing with gospel choirs regularly. Freedom Song, which you can see us there at the Hackney Empire, concludes with songs about the importance of freedom for all. Tonight, we will finish with Roll, Jordan, Roll, one of the spirituals from the Fifth Jubilee book that I was given. Thank you for listening. I thank our wonderful soloists, Emily Dankworth, Christina Gill, Wills Morgan, and Michael Henry for telling the story with me. And I, I thank Justin Butcher for creating the piece with me. If you like the sound of Freedom Song, Come and see a complete performance at the Hackney Empire on Sunday, March the 29th next year. Or do look out for the recording, because we recorded it, and that's coming out just before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you and good night. We'll leave you with this last spiritual. It's called Roll, Jordan, Roll. Roll, Jordan, Roll. roll. Jordan Road. Oh, brothers, you ought to have been there. Yes, my Lord. A sitting in the kingdom to hear Jordan Road. Road, Jordan Road. Bye.